All right, everybody, in this class session, we're going to talk about earned income as a revenue source for nonprofits. Uh, specifically, we'll talk about the shift to earned income that occurred over the past few decades, and then we'll talk about some practical tools that relate to using earned income as a revenue source. Um, the shift to earned income started back in the 60s. We've talked about this idea before, but just some more information to illustrate. Um, back in 1964, uh, nonprofits got about half of their revenue from private donations. As you can see, it, by 2011, that number has dropped to around 13%. It's actually been a pretty huge change. And it's not because donations are shrinking, right? Because you all have drilled that into you by now that Americans give about 2% of GDP. What it is is nonprofits have just grown. And so earned income rose by over 600% during that time period. And this is what allowed for the explosive growth of nonprofits. Um, a lot of that is healthcare driven, but if you subtract um, healthcare nonprofits, earned income still accounts for almost half of nonprofit revenue. Um, part of it has been accelerated, part of this trend is being accelerated further by the social entrepreneurship movement. Um, this is, you know, well, depending on who you talk to, social entrepreneurship is either decades old or it's still relatively young. Um, the, the, the point of social entrepreneurship is to apply business skills to social needs, and nonprofits have faced increasing pressure to engage in social entrepreneurship activities. Um, these are a bunch of the organizations that are very prominent in the social entrepreneurship space, um, but the overall point is that um, the, the use of entrepreneurial techniques to address social needs has driven an increased reliance on earned income for nonprofits. Um, the paper you read uh, relating to this class session makes it clear that uh, as nonprofits have increasingly relied on earned income or fees, um, good things have happened. Bad things, well, maybe have happened. And there's a lot that just really hasn't changed for good or bad. As far as the good things go, nonprofits are much more self-sufficient than they used to be. They have a stronger reputation because they don't have to worry about the volatility of earned income. And with that also comes, or sorry, with the volatility of donations. And with that also comes increased staff retention, right? Because if you're relying on stable markets to provide your goods, then you can keep people hired. You don't have to backtrack on commitments. And so it overall makes a big difference for the nonprofit. There really haven't been any bad things that come f that have come from growth through earned income. Nonprofits have just gotten bigger and more capable of serving the needs that they were designed to serve. There have been a bunch of benign effects, meaning that things haven't changed. Nonprofits can still attract donors just fine. This was a worry because the idea is if nonprofits are earning all this income, then why will people donate? Turns out people still donate. The, the same reasoning has, has held true for volunteers. Nonprofits have been able to fulfill their missions and, and still work on ways to improve their service delivery that ha hasn't been affected by um, earned income as a revenue source. As far as practical tools go for um, earned income, there are just some things to know and understand. One is knowing the difference between average total cost and marginal cost. Um, you probably picked this up in your econ class, but just as a refresher, average total cost is when you take all of the fixed and marginal costs for a set of units produced and then average them by the number of units. So everything it takes to get something out of a factory, it, it then includes the staff time, the cost of the equipment, the cost of your inputs, all those things. You take them, divide them by, divide all those costs by the number of units that you're producing, and that gives you your average total cost. Now, this is important, especially for small organizations, because it's a way that they calculate price. And we'll talk about how to do cost plus pricing next slide. One thing that's bad about using average total costs for calculating your costs is that it ignores marginal costs. And so you don't know what the next unit is going to cost you necessarily. You just know the average across all of your units. Um, Marginal cost is different. If you remember how marginal cost works, it's not so much the how much each unit costs you, it's how much the, producing the next unit is going to cost you. That's important to know and understand because it gives you it helps you decide if you're going to increase production. Remember the supply curve in the long term is upward sloping and what that means is that each additional unit you make costs you more than the previous one. And so you need to be attentive to those costs because the moment you start producing things that are more expensive to you than the market price, you need to stop. So fixed costs are 
therefore irrelevant to marginal costs, which can be a good thing because it means you're going to ignore sunk costs when you make decisions. But the overall point is that uh, you need to understand the difference between these two. The reason you need to know costs, unit costs, is because it's fundamental to running a business. If you don't know how much it costs you to produce each thing, and I mean, I give you an example of factories, but nonprofits produce things all the time. For example, they might produce retreats, right, for um, rehabilitation. And if they do that, they need to know how much each retreat is going to cost them. And without knowing that cost, then they don't know how much money to raise. They don't know how much um, how much to charge. And so you have to know your costs in order to price in a way that's sustainable. When it comes to pricing, um, you know, most big companies have economists who do sophisticated market pricing measures to figure out what the market price is for goods and services so they know how to what to charge customers. A lot of small organizations don't obviously have that skill set or resource, and so what they do is they engage in something called cost-plus pricing. Basically what you do is you take your per-unit cost, or another way to describe that is your average total cost, and multiply it times a markup, which would be one plus a percentage markup. So if you wanted it to be, if you wanted to mark it up 50% percent, you'd and your unit cost was $1, then you, you would take $1 and multiply it times 1.5. Well, that would give you $1.5. And then you know your, your the, the really cool thing about this is then you know your margin. You know how much you're bringing in beyond your costs. So the pros of this, it's really easy to price this way. Um, it covers unexpected costs because if you sort of just build in a cushion, then you know better, that, or then you can um, hopefully have a sufficient cushion for when unexpected costs come up. It also has a larger economic benefit, which is it stabilizes markets from demand shifts. Um, some economists, like Professor Turley, for example, would argue that that's stupid, um, and they're probably right, but it is one of the advantages of it. Um, as far as cons are concerned, well, it ignores the market price. When you when you cost plus price, you're not paying attention to market price necessarily, um, and you're certainly not responding to market price. And so, <clears throat> it also includes all of your sunk costs because if there are fixed costs that are part of your production and part of your per unit cost, well, then you're calculating those costs in to the way you price. Um, and the but the problem is, you know, with a sunk cost is you can't unspend it and so you're pricing in a way that might be irrational and finally it ignores opportunity costs meaning it doesn't actually embed what you could have done otherwise um, which is something you should be considering every time you decide to produce you should be thinking about what else you could be producing so all right um, nonprofits are ripe for um, socially responsible products a lot of organizations think that they can make the world a better place by selling improved products. A lot of the bad that happens in the world relates to consumerism, right? The things we buy have the potential to make the world worse off. And so the idea is, well, let's sell products that are socially responsible, that make the world a better place, and still provide people with their desirable goods and services. Over 50% of consumers claim to be willing to pay for more socially responsible products, and they're basically lying. Um, you know, Ben & Jerry's has pretty awesome social mission, and yet a lot of people don't even know about it. Um, we're going to use Ben & Jerry's as an example as we go through this. Um, some things to consider. First of all, consumers rarely think about social value before functional value. And I want you to think about this. Every time you've bought a socially responsible product, were you willing to put up with something worse, if um, worse than everything else that you could have bought just because it's environmentally friendly, for example? The answer is usually not. If you're not keeping up with the functional value in the market, then your socially responsible product is not going to sell because when it comes down to it, people just want things that work or taste good or whatever it is. Number two, consumers will only pay more for social value if the functional value attributes are sufficient. So there are some people willing to pay more for social products, but if the functional attributes don't come up to muster, then those people that are willing to pay more won't actually do it. Your product has to be at least as good functionally for those people who are willing to pay more to actually pay it. And finally, for most products, consumers are unaware of the social significance. And this is a big deal because it sometimes can be hard to communicate social significance. Um, we'll have a conversation in class about fair trade and how complex that is and how it's a hard message to communicate. 
Okay, so some advice. Be sure the product or service ties closely to the social issue. Um, I once had a, a team of students that wanted to sell T-shirts, and then with a margin from selling T-shirts, a profit margin from selling T-shirts, they would buy bicycles for kids in Thailand. That's a really remote connection, and it wasn't at all clear, and it's not something that consumers intuitively get, and they had a hard time with their business model. Secondly, don't believe surveys. Um, willingness to pay surveys, especially about social products, are notoriously unreliable. When you put somebody in a survey situation, you're basically asking them to project the best version of themselves, and everybody thinks that they're willing to spend more because, A, they imagine they'll have more money in the future, but, B, they also think of themselves as socially responsible, so, of course, they'll buy the so pay more for the socially responsible product. You need to be able to communicate these social benefits quickly and simply. We'll talk about that idea in class. And finally, don't try to force social responsibility. If Remember that uh, autonomy is a really big deal for donors. Well, it's a big deal for consumers, too. I think all of you probably had the experience of buying something where you felt kind of like manipulated into buying it or forced into buying it. That's not a great experience. And if you're going to guilt trip people with social responsibility to buy your product, they will not be repeat customers. Finally, the last interesting thing to talk about is whether or not you as a nonprofit should engage in a profit-making uh, endeavor. Uh, Foster and Broddick, who both work for the Bridgeman Group, which is one of the largest nonprofit consultancies um, in the United States, they did this really cool um, study and then published an article about it in Harvard Business Review. And the essence of it is that is that uh, th most nonprofit earned income ventures don't succeed. Um, they, they end up being failures. I think nonprofits like to think that they can just jump into sort of whatever business, and because they're a nonprofit, people will love them. That's not how it usually works. And in fact, the worst part is, is nonprofits, unfortunately, can do pretty terrible accounting when it comes to this kind of thing. And that's what the Foster and Broadock article is about. Um, what they did is they actually did a cool little case study on a nonprofit in Kansas City. Now, this nonprofit was serving at risk youth, teenagers mostly. The idea was is they wanted to teach some job skills. Well, a donor comes along and says, hey, I have a great idea. I will donate money so you guys can buy a professional kitchen, and then you can use this professional kitchen to teach jobs to these at-risk youth or to teach, like, cooking skills so they can become professional cooks. So the, the nonprofit had the idea of using this professional kitchen to produce salad dressing. No doubt they got the idea from Newman's Own, which is a pretty amazing company that donates all of its profits to charity and is well-known mostly because of its uh, salad dressings. But anyway, um, they did this study on – they did this case study on this nonprofit in Kansas City, and they found some interesting things. Uh, the, the nonprofit was claiming that they were profitable, that they that they were earning a 13 cent, a 30, sorry, a 35 cent margin on each bottle of salad dressing. Well, what's interesting is they sold maybe a few hundred bottles. So this is huge, huge effort for them. And it turns out that <clears throat> 35 cents times the number of bottles they sold wasn't actually that much money. But to make matters worse, they had, they had, uh, not calculated it right. And so when you calculate in sort of some, um, some direct costs that they left off the books because it was donated money, which they and they shouldn't have done that. It turns out that each bottle was actually losing seven dollars and eighteen cents. Now there's a, there were a lot of in, like I said there were a lot of direct costs that were sort of being subsidized by donations, and because they weren't counting those in their cost metrics for the salad dressing, it wasn't reflecting the true cost of producing salad dressing. Well. Then you have to think about all the indirect costs, right? Because there are all these staff that are diverting their attention from other projects, right? Producing salad dressing has an opportunity cost associated with it. When you looked at all the opportunity costs and other indirect costs that came from producing this salad dressing, each bottle actually lost about $86.50. Now, this is a really big deal because the nonprofit thought they were making money off their salad dressing when in reality they were losing a huge amount of money per bottle. Um, the, the thing is, if you're going to engage in a profit-earning endeavor, then you need to account for it just the way any other business would. Because when you don't, you, you hide costs and you don't portray the reality of it and you actually deceive donors and kind of everybody's worse off. So you have to make sure that if you're going to engage in a profit-earning profit endeavor that you are – um, true to the nature of it rather than hiding it with a bunch of donations or other subsidies. 
So the, 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 the article made the point that if you're a nonprofit, you have to be careful because it can give you conflicting priorities. Give You, you come to it you, often with a lack of business perspective. You often rely on a lot of indirect customers like donors who subsidize these things. And uh, what happens is a lot of philanthropic capital gets put into this and then nonprofits engage in an escalation of commitment because they don't want to let down their donors, right? And so you don't want to sort of give back the professional kitchen because you feel terrible. So you're going to stick with it and in the process of sticking with it, you lose more money and be less efficient than you would have been otherwise. Anyway, so with that warning, I will leave you now and I'll see you all in class. <laughs>